welcome you on behalf of the International Institute for Peace here in Vienna. We had invited uh, today, and especially, of course, uh, on the initiative of uh, Mr. Heinz Gertner, Professor Heinz Gertner, a very valuable, very interesting uh, discussion uh, on the Chatham House rule, from guests from Iran, from the United States, from France, of course also from Austria. And uh, we had very good discussions, very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, maybe Stephanie, you want to say some words? No? Because uh, I didn't see you, so it was I suppose to, to give the introduction. Um, we did this uh, discussion because for us in the Institute, and I think for us in Austria in general, it is uh, very, very important that the dialogue between Europeans and, of course, from all the other countries, including the United States of America and the Iran, should be an open dialogue and should be continued, irrespective of some politicians who are not interested in dialogue, but interested more in, in enforcing their point of view on others. And um, Mr. Trump, whom I want to mention in this respect, of course, is enforcing uh, his uh, views and his policies, not only on Iran, but he tries to do it on the European Union and on other countries as well. So his only friend today is uh, the leader in North Korea, so maybe this is uh, this new strong alliance uh, and uh, the alliance on uh, the basis of the new world order Mr. Trump has in mind. But uh, that does not mean that uh, we are envying or we are criticizing the meeting uh, with the uh, leader in North Korea, no, every step towards peace and conciliation and understanding is a good step and an important step. But that is for us, I think, also a step which is necessary uh, with the Islamic Republic of Iran and its people. And therefore, we were very happy that uh, we had several guests today and now uh, uh, Mrs. Hunter is coming as well, and I ask her to join us here on, on the floor. So this is the reason, this is the background of the discussion. We had uh, the whole day from 9 o'clock in the morning until just, uh, I would say, some minutes ago. Uh, a very intensive debate showing, of course, different points of views, not only between countries, but also between Iranians, because... This is the, the important debate we have to have. Now, we thought it would be worthwhile also to uh, go uh, to a public meeting, and I'm very happy and grateful that our, our guests, uh, some of our guests uh, uh, are joining here on the podium. Some of our guests uh, welcomed, of course, here, and also excellencies uh, here welcomed uh, from Iran to have that open discussion and of course also our guests are invited to come into the debate if they want to, to contribute and of course we will uh, try to have an open debate. The basic idea is to have about 10 minutes introduction from each of our guests, there may be some reaction and then of course have questions or short statements, short comments, underlining short, from your side in order to have a real debate and not just an exchange of uh, statements. So uh, the guests here, if I may uh, say it now, coming from the right, is Mohamed Farazman. He is from the Institute for Political and International Studies from Teheran. We have Shirin Hunter, School of Foreign Service from Georgetown University. We have, of course, I'm very grateful, the president of the EPS, one of the, of the most important Foreign Policy Institute in Tehran, Syed Qasim Shahpur. We have then uh, Monsieur Bernard Murgat from Paris, from the Institute uh, Iranian and Indian World, said in an English version. And of course, we have uh, Monsieur Abbas uh, Milani. He is uh, from the program in Iranian studies in the University of Stanford. 
So it's up uh, to uh, to our, uh, especially to Professor Gertner, but also to Mitra. Uh, we got this very prominent personalities here. I want to mention also that in our Institute for Peace there's still for some days an exhibition uh, from Mitra who is uh, Iranian, who has two homes, at least, at least two homes, in Iran and in Austria and of course in art. So if you want to see, just can phone us in the Institute and then we can guarantee that somebody will be there if you can want to come to the exhibition and look at it, and if you take your wallet with you, you can even buy it. Uh, so that uh, should not be prevented. Now maybe, uh, Professor uh, Sasha Boer, maybe ask you to start to give a short introduction how you see the Iran today in the international relations with all these new conditions uh, uh, have been created by Mr. Trump. Um, Maybe you start with a short introduction and then we continue with the other colleagues. Please. I think it's right. So maybe I have to switch it off and then. Switch it on. Yes. yes. No. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be in Vienna and to, in this meeting again. I thank Vienna Institute for, uh, Institute for Peace Studies, or as you call it correctly, Institute, International Institute for Peace. Uh, and uh, I really was impressed by the quality of discussions uh, today. I learned so much, and uh, I appreciate uh, the, this meeting also tonight. Uh, very briefly on Iran and international system, in response to your question, my first point is that I don't equate international system with Mr. Trump. Uh, more importantly, I don't equate international system with the United States. Uh, yes, the United States is a big player in international system, but I do think that international system is evolving, is changing, and uh, is a state of transition. Of course, the transition is not uh, uh, maybe a very accurate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, concept uh, depicting all the realities. But however, what is clear for me that uh, we are living in a, a post, uh, let's say, Western world. It's not the best as it was before. Uh, it doesn't mean the West is not important or United States is not important, but there are multiple sources of power emerging, multiple players emerging here and there. So the international system is more uh, complex today than it was before, and I think it is becoming more uh, complex. The high degree of complexity uh, accompanies with high degree of unpredictability and high degree of interconnectivity, which makes the situation very uh, different from the past. So I think one element of unpredictability, impulsiveness, is Mr. Trump's policy, but it is not him per se. In international system, you see the pace of development here, the, uh, is very different from the past. Uh, but what's important about this international system is uh, uh, it is giving a space to new players, uh, to different actors, and I think one of uh, the facts in this space is that regional players are becoming more important. And Iran is a regional player by all standards, all means, and I think Iran is getting more space, uh, both regionally and globally, uh, to act. So my first uh, response to the question of Iran and in international system is that Iran is a part of this evolving international system, uh, and it is one of the 
regional players which should be taken into account. Second point about the Iran and, uh, Iran and international system is maybe we can look at this relationship on three levels or dimensions. Iran as a shaper of international uh, uh, system. JCPOA, which happened in the city, I think was a shaping uh, factor in this evolving uh, international system. The role of uh, Austria as a, a player in providing the space is also one of the elements of new international uh, evolving system. But uh, what's important that JCPOA was the first time maybe a developing country sitting with uh, uh, global players for two and a half year of negotiation and coming to a type of arrangement which was not before. Uh, it was uh, a different, let's say, setting in the Cold War time. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, withdrawal of the United States also is contributing to, uh, let's say, how international, new international uh, system is shaped. And I think here Iran is a factor. Whether they like it or do not like it, what Iranian reaction uh, is and is going to be, I think, contributes to this uh, concept of shaping. And it's not the first time that Iran is a shaper or is one of the shapers. What happened during uh, past centuries, uh, even last century, Cold War started in Iran, uh, in a way, according to some, uh, uh, let's say, analytical studies, especially by the occupation or well, uh, lack of interest on the part of Soviet Union to withdraw its forces from Iran after World War II. And uh, you may know that the first, thank you, the first, uh, oh, yeah. we form a session. Now we shape the, the glasses. We cannot shape the world, but we can shape the glasses. Uh, I think the first, uh, let's say, uh, uh, security issue which was raised in the Security Council after the, its establishment was Iranian complaint from Soviet Union. So Iran has been a shaper uh, and I think remains a shaper. Second, I think Iran is, is a victim of international system and I'm not going to get to blame game, but we have always been uh, a victim of great power politics. And look, look at JCPOA. We negotiated uh, word by word, uh, comma by comma, with, uh, let's say, so much energy to resolve a conflict which has a lot of, let's say, potentials for becoming more complicated. Now a gentleman has come uh, in the White House and negating this. And I think uh, if you put yourself in the place of Iranians and Iranian officials, you see another mistrust of the West, another, uh, let's say, another time that you become the victim, not of just a player, but one personality in one of these per uh, players, or a, a trend, a thinking, which is very important in this regard. The third, I think, uh, uh, is in today, not Iran is uh, just contributing uh, uh, to the shaping of international system, but because some of the shaping processes has not been of Iran's its own, it has been, uh, uh, let's say, a type of unintended consequences of uh, international setting, but I think what's interesting today and makes different from the past is Iran a real actor in its own region and, a, and when it comes to global politics. Actorship of Iran is a fact and I, you know, I know when you are in the West, when you read all the papers, you see that, uh, you know, a lot of negativity, a lot of negative coverage of Iran and everything about this country is, seems to, to be negative. Of course, 
Austria is an exception. There is a much better understanding here. But when you go on the real scene, especially in the regional context, you see Iran is really an actor, and a self-confident actor. We are not, uh, let's say, frightened by this uh, fluctuation of uh, politics in D.C. We are not uh, uh, shocked, as some of Arab uh, allies of the United States are shocked. They were very angry at Obama. Now they are happy with uh, uh, Trump, but they are becoming a little, again, unhappy with the United States because uh, they are not as their potentials are the real actor. What they are, they have been proxies of United States in a way or the other. And I think this actorship of Iran, which I explained a couple of points and end, is due to two facts. First, Iranian revolution. Now we are getting to the 40th anniversary of Iranian revolution. Iranian revolution and the motto, Estadrol Azadi Jumhuri Islami. I think everybody, even though may disagree on the domestic uh, uh, developments in Iran or have on some res reservations about some policies here and there, cannot uh, confirm any, anything that Iran is an independent uh, player. And Iran, for Iran, independence is a key and makes this decision. Some people may not like the way that Iran makes its independent decisions, but it is an independence uh, process which has been the byproduct of revolution. And I think that's very important. It doesn't mean that we were, uh, let's say, uh, uh, under colonial, direct colonial, uh, let's say, rulership before revolution. Iran had its nominal uh, independence, but I have personally uh, represented Iran in the United Nations, and I have heard from two who were working in different occasions in the United Nations, uh, missions of Iran, and I do remember one of them told me I was a very junior, I was assigned to the Fifth Committee of the United Nations uh, General Assembly, and my superior told me if you do not know how to take position, look at the American delegation. However they take position, you follow them. And the other one was the first review conference on NPT, Ambassador Sultania's expertise. And uh, an Iranian who lives in Geneva right now, who told me I was in part of delegation giving consultation. And one day we took this position that uh, 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 it was third of third world nature, and a, a gentleman from the uh, American delegation came to our table and said, it is not a typical Iranian position. So he protested, or the United States protested, to how Iran has uh, been uh, you know, accompanying the developing world, and it took 24 hours, less than 24 hours. Shaw was in Mexico. United States talked with uh, 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 the Shah, and he instructed the Iranian delegation in Geneva to change the position. And tomorrow we came, and uh, we changed our position. Uh, and he, he told me, this gentleman, that it was disgusting. So I think this independence is very uh, dear, very important, and it's the reason that Iran is an actor. Second, I think, is Iranian achievements. Yes, we could get more. There are endless, let's say, goals that we have to achieve. But nobody can ignore that Iran today is providing its security itself. And it's not an easy uh, projection in that part of the world. Uh, and I think this is very important that not only providing security for uh, its borders, as you have seen in the case of ISIS, and fighting with ISIS and with the other radicals uh, that you all know, Iran spared blood and money and energy and defeated them. And I think this is providing security for 
the regional settings. So to sum up, yes, we have a, an international system which is not uh, still uh, clear, but it is uh, in the state of transition. In this transition, Iran is an issue. Iran is a player. Iran is a victim. But what's important, international system cannot be understood today without taking into account the quality and the shape of Iranian foreign policy, its regional interaction, and its global engagement. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, uh, positioning of uh, yourself and Iran. And it was interesting to, to listen to the uh, close relationship between Iran and the um, United States of America, at least in some phases of the Shah regime. We discussed today that maybe that was changing. Who was in the lead? Sometimes the U.S., sometimes the Shah. But anyway, it was a strange uh, relationship from our point of view, and that was also the reason for one of the reasons for the revolution. Now, let's perhaps come briefly to Europe, to a European voice, a voice from Paris, because I think uh, with all the criticism on European positions, it's a bit different, the relationship between Europe and Iran. It's your pleasure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for giving me, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to try to explain what is the European position now in the Iranian crisis or facing the new developments of the relation between uh, Iran, the US, and Europe. We have to remember first that Iran is our first neighbor of the East, traditional neighbor of the East. In the past, in the past, in the past, in the past, we were fighting with Iran, the Turks arrived recently. So our relation, traditional relation with Iran is quite important. It is a strategic issue for Europe as a, as a whole. And uh, traditionally, European countries had a strong relation with the US, with the Iran during the uh, 20th century. The UK was important because of oil, and then the US. USA was more or less ruling Iran during the Shah's regime, and European countries had a strong position in that time. When the revolution occurred in 77, 78, the population and the people of Europe were supporting the revolution for human rights. The Shah was uh, uh, described as a dictator, as with the Sabah being a, a bloody uh, repression, the dictatorship, and also because of uh, uh, anti imperialism remember the war of, uh, of Vietnam and the fall of Saigon, or just in 76, two, three years before the Islamic Revolution. So people in Europe were supporting the revolution as a whole to see a democratic state, a republic taking place of the Shah's regime. And of course things were changing after a while because of the hostage crisis and the fact that Iran became a country hostile to the West, to Western countries and to the US. And during the Iran Iraq War, the longest war in the 20th century, from 80 to 88, European countries were supporting Arab countries and the rest of the world against Iran. So the relation between Europe and Iran were quite, quite difficult at that time. And Iran also had terrorist activities in Paris, people killed in Iran. But this period of the war was fortunately followed by a period of cooperation and critical dialogue. In Europe, we are thinking that we have to do something with the new Iran. In the middle, we shall not have any policy of regime change, something to regime to have the Shah back in Iran and uh, in, in Tehran, but to try to understand that something important open, happened in Iran. The social revolution, the political new revolution, with Islamic revolution, uh, uh, supporting independence, liberty, republic, Islamic. And so, we started with, you know, a political dialogue, a critical dialogue for years. For years. And, pointing out the fact that we are not exactly the same policy as the U.S. We were much more humiliated by the hostage crisis and looking for a regime change. 
This critical dialogue was very important because we never abandoned that, even in tough periods. And later, when uh, uh, the, the nuclear crisis began in the 2001-2003, after 9-11 and the attacks of al Qaeda in Tehran, and the collapse of the Taliban power in Afghanistan, and the collapse of Saddam Hussein in, uh, in Iraq, European countries have seen clearly that they have to do something. We are joking saying that Afghanistan is just a breakfast, Iraq is a lunch, and the Greek duck supper with dinner will be warm. And so they would like, and the US would like to take the power completely in the Middle East, and on the European side, they don't agree with that. Making war is not a way to promote stability in the near region. And so, the morning of uh, October uh, 2003, Mr. Philippe Strou and Fischer, Mr. Foreign Affairs of, Mr. Foreign Affairs of France, UK and Germany, went to Tehran in a few hours with Mr. Hub, uh, who I think was in charge of security at that time in Iran, signed an agreement on nuclear issue, which was more or less GCPOA, which was signed uh, 12 years later. And so Europe was clearly facing the U.S., having a different policy of the U.S. And unfortunately, this agreement made by the European countries was not accepted by the U.S. And so after a few years, in 2005, the uh, Iranian resume enrichment of uranium. It was a failure of the relation between Europe and Iran, but much more a failure of the relation between Europe and the U.S. So, after some years, GCPOA was signed. It was a way for Iran to resume relations, if not to resume, to start new relations with the world. And so immediately, French, German, Austrian, Italian, Belgium, UK, Germany, Russia, they want to try to promote the economic development and to make Iran and the people of Iran happy being able to work in an international level. And these optimistic times of GCPOA, 2015, 16, 17, was more or less a new spring for Iranian-European relations. But in the US, they were implementing secondary sanctions. They abandoned sanctions on nuclear issue, but not on terrorism, on supporting uh, as well as things like that, in human rights. So we are facing a new crisis between Europe and uh, and the, the, the U.S. And when the Trump administration occurred, it was clear the problem. Trump said, I don't agree with this major achievement of, of diplomacy, which was GCPOA. After years and years, a major diplomatic uh, tool was used to uh, solve the problem of a major international crisis. And in Europe, we are supporting critical dialogue. We are supporting dialogue. We are supporting uh, uh, development of Iran because for our security it's important that to have in the Middle East a strong, stable, peaceful country. Which country can it be? Egypt? No. Iraq? No. Afghanistan? Syria? Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia and all monarchies are produced for supporting jihadism, Al Qaeda or Daesh or ISIS of different terms. And so, the only country having a civilization, a population, a state, even if we disagree with many points, even the policy, we can have that in a, new, in a few years, a strong, stable policy to be our partner in the Middle East and also to be the only country able to defeat Daesh, ISIS, because we are facing terrorism in Europe, and the only country able to make, to help us facing and defeating Daesh is Iran, even if we disagree with the Iranian policy. And that is why we are now facing a new conflict between Europe and the US. And Iran is just a part of that. And the new regulation in the US about iron and aluminium and also making uh, commercial activities with Iran is one of the major issues we actually shall have to face. It is a problem of Iran, it's a problem of Europe and the US. It is a new step in the international relation, and Iran, unfortunately, is a battlefield of this new uh, policy. We have to remember that the resolution number one of the UN was in 1947 to order the Soviet troops to hit Iran. And now Iran again is in the sense it was the beginning of a Cold War. And now Iran is again 
the country where the major issue between the division, about the division between Europe and the US in his making, unfortunately for Iranian people. Let's see what the future will be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, Professor Hunter, she has uh, Azeri Iranian roots. She's teaching She's Iranian. 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 She don't qualify. No, Azeris sorry. are Iranians as well. Yeah, yeah, but uh, <laughs> especially Iranian roots, because you mentioned that also in the discussion. And uh, therefore, I think uh, it's teaching now at uh, Chosun University. So, please, what, what's your position? How do you see the situation? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for the organizers of this uh, conference, and particularly uh, to Mitra Shamuradi. I'm sure that she was the one that was instigator, and Professor Heinz Geithner. And uh, we had this wonderful meeting in Washington, and so I am here and uh, in the beautiful city of Vienna that I really like. So again, thanks very much to everybody and to the colleagues. Uh, I would like to start, uh, I am now have become, I started life as a diplomat, and you mentioned the non-proliferation treaty conference. I, the first non-proliferation treaty conference was on May in 1975, and it was, I was with the Iranian mission to the United Nations, and that's, I participated on that. We did not get our uh, instructions on MGT from the American delegation. I can assure you. No, I you. didn't say all. No, no, I, we place. did not. I, I can, can name the person who told no, me. No, no, no. He must have lied, whoever he was. There were a lot of people that were. I was there, and that's how I met my husband, actually. So that is one thing I wanted to just clarify. That was the first non proliferation. We always insisted on Article 6. Our position and that of the entire non-aligned movement was the same on this matter. So it wasn't that Iran was not a lackey at the time that, you know, so that suddenly. But having said that, let me just say a few things about the nature of international relations. You will excuse me if I talk like a school marmishly. In other words, I, I like a school teacher. To begin with, uh, the international system is still a state-based system. Uh, the, uh, this question of the obsolescence of the uh, nation state has been going on at least since the 1960s. I remember the first, and since I finished just one book, and all this thing is very fresh in my mind. Yes, the, the centrality of nation state has been eroded by the emergence of uh, non-state actors, the latest of which are groups like Hezbollah and ISIS and so on, but most of these are also supported by states. In other words, that without the support of the state, non-state actors cannot operate. So that is one uh, characteristic, that we are still living in a, a state-based international system. This is the one. Um, the other thing is that the international system is still characterized by the inequality of states. Again, whether one likes it or not, it's very nice in UN. You know, I served about six years in UN in different things uh, and commissions. It's very nice to like this uh, sort of fuzzy language of uh, one vote, one country, and so on. But the international system is based on the uh, inequality of the state, some of which derive from their uh, uh, physical and other characteristics. The fact is that Iran and Qatar are not equal because Iran is how many times larger? No doubt, 100 percent <laughs> argument. How much that's it? But by the same token, uh, Iran and Russia are not equal. Nor is Iran and United States of America. As much as it uh, pains me to say so, but that is the fact. The other thing is the combined economic and military power. Yes, there are new uh, powers coming to uh, thing. One is obviously China, everybody talks, or people talk about India, but none of them have the combined military, economic, intellectual, human resources to be a, a, you know, a challenge, a really effective challenge, frankly, I would say to the United States. Obviously, the United States is not omnipotent. 
You never have said that it's omnipotent. But the fact is that it would help if Iran understood this. Instead of dreaming about the American demise, which I read every day, that America in decline and so on. It is maybe, but it's still it's going to take, like the Roman Empire took about 300 years, the decline and fall of Roman Empire took about 300 years. I think if America survives at least uh, three decades, I think that it would be too late for Iran to do certain things. This is the, the other thing that uh, I, I think, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a very plain spoken person. So I think this is what it is. The other thing I have to say, international relations, unfortunately, is not based on rules or ethics. Power is still is the dominant thing. We all have to do with the, the uh, um, configuration of the United Nations Security Council. Why do you think that they put the veto power? Because nobody can impose on a Soviet Union or on a Russia anything. And if you don't have the sort of implementing power, you're not going to be able, all the rules are just, I'm not saying I wish it was true, but the fact is Hobbes was more correct than Rousseau. We are still, we are still, as my teacher Henry Bull said, we are still living in an anarchical society. And so it's not rule-based. So this is another thing. It's a realist school. Uh, well, it is a realist school because it's coming back. You know, the, the, the fact is reality is there. All this the sort of subjective, intersubjectivity and so on, that we used to call it perception versus things and so on. And I don't want to get into that. Let me come on to the role of Iran. The way you talk as if that Iran's history began after the Islamic Revolution. No. Well, that's what you are, the way you are behaving, there was the Jahiliyyah before, and now suddenly light has come, and everything is, uh, uh, you know, blooming, and, 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 and so the death is not it. Iran's history has been going on. Iran was never a passive uh, a member of the international society. You, all you have to do is to go and look at the Safavis, the way they interacted with Europe, uh, the way, even the Qatars, with all their uh, uh, thing. I mean, you know, Abbas Mirza was a gallant person uh, that gave his life for it. And the same thing, the so-called much maligned Shah uh, that, uh, again, I'm not trying to defend him. I'm trying to defend the statehood of Iran that is far more continuous. Um, and I think that this is very important. Nobody, except for the allied occupation of uh, Allied occupation of uh, Iran, none of Iran's neighbors dared to attack Iran before. Whereas Saddam Hussein came finally, said to Shah, fine, after all these years of from Arzanata room, it, or whatever, said, okay, I accept the Taliban. And now even your friends in the Nuri al Maliki doesn't recognize Algeria's agreement. So Iran has always been an actor. So this is nothing really very new. But let me, before going into JCPOA, and I will go to the uh, finish it uh, to try. But the point is that uh, independence is already a very good thing, but you are contradicting yourself. You are saying that the international system is moving through interdependent, and on the other hand, you are saying Iran has to be independent. Your, Iran has to build this, this uh, kind of uh, uh, protective against it that no foreign influence can come and dilute the purity of the Islamic regime. And uh, that is not going to work out. It, it's just you're, you know, basically you are contradicting yourself. Having said that, I will come back, so the point is, Iran has to realize the limits of its own power, the realities of international politics, and the fact is that you have to understand, good or bad, I'm not saying it's any good, you have to deal with the United States of America. And uh, it is not that America is good. No, America has a lot of problems. And uh, they are maybe doing sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. But it is a big, big player. It's a big international player. So you can't ignore it. Even Kim Jong-un finally couldn't ignore it. <laughs> you see, uh, China may be one day, but again, it might be late. 
China is not going to come and confront um, the United States for Iran's sake. Nor would Russia. China is not going to bring in ships into the Persian Gulf. That, they have a different agenda for themselves. You, so these are the realities of the international system that Iran has to come to terms and has to deal with that. Having said that, I will say two words about Donald Trump, and then I will stop. I think Donald Trump is one of those hurricanes that we get so frequently in America. And when a hurricane happens, what you have to do? You take whatever you have, your flashlight and water, and go hide in your basement, wait until the, you know, the hurricane passes and life returns to normal. To so having said that, I believe that what Trump did regarding JCPOA uh, is a big, big mistake. Having said all this, you know, uh, qualms I have with certain interpretation of the Islamic government of the international relations, I also have to say that the international system has not, particularly in the last 20 years, treated them fairly. Uh, there were a lot of I mean, um, overtures they made that it was rebuffed. The reason why that happened, in part, was because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union had not collapsed, Iran and U.S. now would have had relations. But U.S. now thinks that it doesn't need to have Iran. Iran's value as a buffer has disappeared. And now Iran has become a nuisance, a pesky little <laughs> player that goes and creates uh, trouble um, you know, in different places. Having said that, I do believe that it pays all the international players to engage Iran rather than rebuff Iran. To have to engage the better uh, aspects, because there are a lot of good people in the country and even within the government that would like to do the right thing. So it's much better to engage Iran. And I think the worst thing to do is with the GCPOA is to show to Iranians that there is really no reward for good behavior. And this is a big mistake. And because I think that having said all those things that inequality of states and so on, the big powers are not completely, um, cannot evade uh, uh, harm either. So yes. If there is, God forbid, some military confrontation between U.S. and Iran, definitely U.S. could destroy Iran. That's no. But America will suffer too. The region will suffer too. It's not going to be limited just to Iran. All these people who are warmongering Saudi Arabia and so on, they are not going to remain uh, immune. So my plea, if I may <laughs> be so bold and so presumptuous as to say that, is both to Iran and its uh, interlocutors, be it in the United States or be it uh, in Europe, that the road of engagement is much better than confrontation. Um, and because confrontation will damage everybody, whereas engagement might have benefits for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And now we'll go to Professor Abbas Milani, who also has Iranian roots, but is teaching in the United States, in this case, in the University of Stanford. Please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I thought instead of uh, trying to get into the politics of Iran and the international system, I'll try to talk about what does it mean to be Iran, and what does the international system mean? I think both of these, Iran as an idea, the international system as a system, is undergoing and has undergone profound historical changes. I would say more than historical changes. I would say both have gone and undergoing epochal changes. These are changes that basically redefine what it means to be Iran and what it means to be international relations. Let me first begin with Iran. 
Over the last 120 years, Iran has experienced three transformations that have been unprecedented in its 3,000-year history. First, in 1900, Iran was a society of 90% villagers who had never traveled outside. Today, Iran is at 25% at best in the countryside, and virtually everybody in that countryside is connected to the internet. Some of them might be listening to this conversation as we speak. There are more cell phones in Iran, more smartphones in Iran, than there are people. There are 110 million smartphones in Iran. That Iran is not the Iran of 1900. You now have a primarily urbanized, globalized society. Second transformation. Iran in 1900 virtually imprisoned half of its population inside the home, called Andarun. Women were not allowed to exit the house. Last year, 60-odd percent of college graduates in Iran were women. Last year, for the first time in the history of Iran, there were more women published authors than there were men. So women, in spite of every effort by every regime, and by some in this regime, have now asserted themselves. They're public, part of the public domain. They're demanding their rights as equal citizens. And that is a remarkable historical change. Third, today, for the first time in 3,000-year history of Iran, 10% of Iran's population lives outside Iran. Iran is no longer limited to what happens inside Iran. Iran is now an expanded idea. Everybody who worries about Iran, everybody who thinks about Iran, everybody who wants to themselves, not with the help of outsiders, themselves, with the help of Iranians, change Iran is part of this larger Iran. And it is a remarkable Iran. The problems of Iran's future cannot be solved without the help of the Iranians outside. The Iranians outside have access to almost $700 billion of assets. Ahmadinejad government almost single-handedly wasted $700 billion. The managerial skill, the professional skill, the medical skill, the entrepreneurial skill, of this diaspora is an absolute indispensable part of the solution for Iran. So we have three ch changes that in Europe almost took 400 years. The change from a, a, a essentially village-based economy to an urban-based economy, the uh, emergence of women, and the exile has not, uh, has not happened except to places like Italy, uh, Ireland, uh, Poland, Iran has experienced all of these. The international community is equally changing. The international community today is not the international community of 1979. The Westphalian system based on national sovereignty is no longer. With the internet age, countries no longer control their territories. You can move billions and you can move ideas across borders that used to be possible to protect. We live in a digital age. Individual sovereignty is no longer uh, absolutely ensured. Look at what Cambridge Analytics did with American elections. They studied every person's voting patterns, every person's expenditures, and they pinpointed what you wanted to hear and with that pinpoint, they determined the results of the election. With 75,000 people, they determined the election for, Ronald Reagan, for Donald Trump. That level of control, that level of scrutiny, that level of how much control your iPhone gives to you and to those who want to monitor you is completely undermining the notion of sovereignty as we understood it after the modern age. 
We are in the middle of a revolution comparable only to the Renaissance. The very idea of knowledge, the very idea of dissemination of knowledge, who can have knowledge, is changing. On this circumstance, something else has happened. You have for the first time in 13 centuries of relationships between Muslims and the West, more Muslims living in the West than you had Christians and Jews living in the Islamic world. You have 50 million and counting living in Europe and the United States. Muslims did not come to Europe. There was no economic need to come to Europe. Muslims in 12th century had the most vibrant economy, the most vibrant libraries, the most vibrant universities. People from uh, Sweden came to Marare to get a PhD in astrophysics. That has changed. You have 50 million people and counting. And you have in Saudi Arabia, and you have in parts of the Shiite world, and parts of Iran, and parts of the regime in Iran, a commitment to pro propagating radical versions of Islam. Saudis have spent, by some account, $60 billion in promoting Wahhabism. That promotion of Wahhabism is not going to help us solve the problems of the future international community unless we find a way of incorporating this new population. The existence of this new population has, read, has led to the rise of populism. Populism in Europe, populism in the United States. Liberal democracies and the liberal democratic international structure, as we have understood it, as we thought was intact, is now under attack in Europe, it is under attack in the United States. It is under attack internationally. So we are living in an incredible moment of crisis. And for more than ever, we need prudent leadership on both sides of the Atlantic and all sides of the world. And we are not getting it. And that, to me, is a very, very serious uh, cause for concern. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, perspective, uh, including the questions of the diaspora and the global future. And uh, we started with the voice from Iran, and we will end this program here with the voice from Iran, Mohammed Farisman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you in University of Vienna, and thanks to the organizer. I'm going to speak about Iranian regional role, and one of the uh, interesting questions uh, in the West is the type of relation between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, some people in the West think that uh, most of the chaos and instability in the region is because of rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I will explain uh, to what extent this uh, perception and narrative is uh, correct or not. Uh, Saudi Arabia, in recent years, uh, has been concentrated on, on, on Iran, and they are trying to say that Iran is uh, the, the, the number one uh, security problem in the region, and uh, the chaos in the region is because of uh, Iran, and Iran should be uh, contained, and they encourage uh, the other allies, United States, Israel, and some other Arabic countries uh, to confront Iran. They oppose all the uh, Iranian uh, policies, regional policies, and also they oppose what has been done between Iran and, and the big powers over the uh, nuclear fight. We think that Saudi Arabia is or has been the hostage of its mistake, and Iran is not responsible for the uh, mistake 
which was uh, made by, by Saudi Arabia. Just look at what King Salman and his son MBS did in recent uh, years, in uh, two years. The first mistake was Yemen war. Mohammed bin Salman, when his father took the power, wanted to show himself as a hero. And he thought that Yemen is a very uh, simple target. The only hero in the history of Saudi Arabia was King Abdulaziz, and he wanted to be the second King Abdulaziz, and he uh, selected Yemen to show that he is something. And he wanted to uh, show to his brothers and to his uh, nephews that he is a capable um, leader. This war cost $200 billion for Saudi Arabia, and still, after three years, Saudi Arabia, with all the support uh, which received from United States and United Kingdom, could not make a victory, military victory, inside Yemen. The second mistake of Saudi Arabia uh, was Qatar blockade, the Qatar crisis. Mohammed bin Salman and his father, King Salman, they destroyed uh, G GCC, uh, Gulf Corporation uh, Council. It was the uh, solid, it was a solid uh, uh, group inside the Arab world, and because of Qatar crisis, they destroyed uh, this group. Inside GCC. Two countries are friends of Iran, Oman, and Qatar, and two countries are allies of Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, and Bahrain. Lebanon was another mistake of Saudi Arabia. They invited the prime minister and they took him as a hostage. What was the consequence and what was the result? Recent, recently, Lebanese had uh, an election and the resistance groups, Hezbollah and its allies, were the winner of the uh, election in, in uh, Lebanon. Iraq was another mistake of Saudi Arabia. Since 2003, Saudi Arabia did not recognize the new system of Iraq. And when they established a uh, relation with, Saudi, with uh, Iraq, and when they sent their ambassador to Iraq in 2015, the only task of Saudi ambassador in Iraq was concentrating on Iran and showing Iran as the enemy of Iraq and, and Arab world. What was the, the result? The Iraq government deported the Saudi ambassador. And you know that Iraq is a very important country in the region. Recently, they decided again to uh, send their ambassador and to reopen the embassy. And this time, we hope that they uh, will not uh, repeat the, the same mistake that they did uh, before. So, what Saudi Arabia did in the region is not related to Iran, and it's not because of Iran. They prefer to concentrate on Iran because of some other uh, problems. Foreign policy is not the only problem of Saudi Arabia. They have many challenges, internal challenges, inside Saudi Arabia. One of the challenges in Saudi Arabia, very critical, is uh, the type of uh, system that they are going to uh, uh, they are going to build because Saudi Arabia uh, today is not anymore the traditional Saudi Arabia that we uh, knew before. Shifting the power is a challenge for Saudi Arabia. The uh, power is going to shift from the old and traditional leaders to uh, a younger generation. And still, uh, it's not guarantee for MBS to uh, take the throne in, in, in uh, 
Saudi Arabia. Economy is another challenge of Saudi Arabia. Since 2015, they lost less than uh, more than 300 billion dollar from their foreign reserve. And the foreign reserve of Saudi Arabia is less than 450 uh, billion dollar. It was 750 in 2015, and for, for the first time in the, in the history of Saudi Arabia, they have uh, deficit in their budget and deficit uh, and the the amount of deficit is very huge. It's one fourth of the uh, budget. Confronting Wahhabism is another challenge of Saudi Arabia. For more than 80, uh, for more than 80 years since the new Saudi Arabia established in uh, 32 in 1932, Wahhabism and Wahhabi clergy were were one of the uh, pillars of power in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia. Uh, traditional Saudi Arabia, there were two pillars, Wahhabism and so Al Saud family. MBS destroyed both pillars. More than 90% of the, the, the Saudi princes are, are opposition right now. And the clergy, Wahhabi clergy also are uh, oppositions. Where is Iran in all these uh, problems inside and outside uh, Saudi Arabia. Iran is not against uh, the system in Saudi Arabia. And I can say that most of the ambitions of MBZ is not against Iran. And uh, we can wish him to be succeed in some of his ambitions. If he, wanted, if he wants to change Saudi Arabia to a moderate country, it's good for Iran. We prefer to have a moderate country in our uh, neighborhood. If he wants to contain Wahhabism, it's good for Iran because Wahhabism and Wahhabis were against Iran most of the time and they were considering Iran and Shia as, as uh, enemy. If he wants to uh, establish a high-tech uh, city, Naom, it's good for Iran because uh, they are going to. Uh, they, they need more money, and the, the only source of income for Saudi Arabia right now is oil. So, uh, during the last years, Saudi Arabia uh, left his traditional oil policy, and they are asking for more prices in oil. And it is good for for Iran. On the other hand, we do not want to consider Saudi Arabia as enemy. And all the time we were receiving, uh, when we were receiving initiatives uh, from the third parties, we welcome all the initiatives. We want the escalation with Saudi Arabia, and uh, we propose a, a regional initiative for having a, a regional dialogue among among the regional uh, states. Why Iran? does not like to confront Saudi Arabia. It is not because that Iran is weak. It is because that Iran has more self-confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, regional aspect of uh, <coughs> the region, of course. So, you have statements, uh, different attitudes or orientations. Who wants to start with the question? The microphone, so we have two questions on this side. Uh, director, so kind of brings you the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's, uh, to speak in, in, into, you speak into the microphone. Yeah. It's an honor to be in this forum. And uh, I would like to just raise two questions. One, it will be a first to Dr. Milani of the public into the sanctuary in order to write back to this question and second to uh, Dr. Frozen. The first question is about the how do you see the prospects uh, regarding the relations uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran? Uh, have you considered the, the 
the state of anarchy, and actually in a scholarly tension between the two countries and the conflict of interest that the two countries have. And the second question would be the fact that we know already that uh, Saudi Arabia has money, gold, and the threat of Iran as a means to help support the role of the United States and other countries. So, how does Iran actually want to compete with Saudi Arabia in that sense that uh, actually Saudi Arabia has actually all the world behind Thank you. Thank you. We will collect some questions, maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> I want for the first time before my own to 
to say something interesting for food for thought. What was the situation before the revolution and after? Shah decided to take the nuclear base of Austria to put in Iran in a secret deal between US and Austria at that time. And I was in atomic energy at that time. I didn't believe that. That is not that's too much emulation for Iranians without a nuclear facilities and reactors to have the waste of the other countries. After the revolution, I became director of nuclear Research Center. I requested to find if such a thing was true or not. I swear, and this is a document which says the uh, Majesty has decided, and this was a letter, secret letter, yes, the waste will come and dump in Iran. And this is a document. And after the revolution, I came here in 35 years as ambassador. I was very curious. So I found out that the power plant of Swindon, Austrian power plant, which was decided to complete due to the problem of waste, which Iran after the revolution didn't accept it, this reactor is now a museum. And because of this, they couldn't do it, and no other country accepted the waste. These are many things technical I can say, but that suffice for this time. I appreciate it for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe we start with the answer and the questions from here. Uh, well, because uh, uh, I have written a book on the shop, I think I have to address with the ambassadors. Uh, we don't have one shop. We have a shop that rules on from 1941 to 1997. The Shah of 1941 might have been told what to do, but the Shah of 1972 told the Americans what to do in Iraq, for example. Look at the role of the Iranian vision and with the help of Israel, with the reluctant help of the US and the reluctant help of Israel in arming the Kurds against Saddam Hussein. So the notion that the Shah at all times was watching what the Americans were telling them is simply false. It is also false to say that he followed the Americans on the nuclear issue. You have obviously access to the documents I have access, and I invite everybody to go to National Security Archive. There is a whole dossier called Iran's nuclear program. You will see that the Shah fought ferociously with the Americans, when the Americans wanted to deny Iran the right to enrich uranium. I think he was wrong. I think Iran should have, and I have written an article about this with Sig Hacker, that Iran should have gone the South Korea way. Iran should have gone for technology rather than for enrichment. But when the Americans tried to stop the Shah, you see the documents, the Shah is fighting ferociously, saying, I'm not going to take conditions that you are not going to require everybody else. I want every right with an MPT. That's the Shah of 1972. The Shah of 1978 won't drink a glass of water without consulting the Americans. So I think it's very simple, I think, I, I, my apologies to you, to simply say that the Shah in that period was following. In 19... Uh, 45, when Iran filed the first uh, ambassador, uh, Sajjad Pur was mentioning, Iran was fi filing the first complaint against National Security Council, against Soviet Union. Britain, which at that time was the dominant power in Iran, tried everything it could to dissuade Iran from uh, following. Iran, with the help of the United States, filed that. So I think it's a very dynamic situation. And I think understanding the Shah and understanding the evolution, you have to look at it historically. At times, you're absolutely right. In 1955, I gave that example this morning. In 1955, the Shah wanted to leave Iran for a short time. The Americans told him, it's not right for you to leave. Wait till you finish the oil negotiations. That was the reality in 55. But in 75, he told the President of the United States, don't threaten us, don't show your finger, we'll show you our fist. So we have a different. Uh, let me just, uh, on the issue of uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, 
I don't think there can be security in the Persian Gulf unless there are two stable, wise, prudent Iran and Saudi Arabia. Those are the two pillars of stability. I think the uh, uh, Trump policy, essentially led apparently by Kushner and maybe helped by Netanyahu, to overcorrect what they thought was Obama's too much leaning towards Iran. Now, allowing himself completely lock, stock, and barrel with the Saudi Arabia is a grave strategic error. It won't bring the peace to the region. It won't help Saudi Arabia. But you cannot allow Saudi Arabia, for example, to do what it's doing in uh, Yemen. For the United States to keep quiet about what is happening in Saudi Arabia, and for Europe to keep quiet, for everyone to keep quiet, for us to keep quiet. Thousands of children are dying in Yemen today. Why is the international community silent? Why is the uh, United States silent? That, to me, will, in the long run, come back to haunt the United States. One last point on, uh, on immigration. You said on immigration. First of all, Iran, to its credit, has the largest number of immigrants in the country. Iran has almost two million uh, Afghans. To its shame, it treats them badly often. To its shame, it often sometimes doesn't allow them to go to school. It sometimes doesn't allow them to work. It uses them as proxies in Syria. But you can't say Iran hasn't helped with the basic immigration. Now, you should ask that question, that same question, from United Arab Emirates, from Saudi Arabia, from all the Gulf states. Four-fifths of their labor force is imported. Why aren't they importing Syrian uh, refugees? Why aren't they importing Iraqi refugees? There aren't a single one of these being employed as laborers where they import them from everywhere else. I'm sorry I went along too, too long. I apologize. No, 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 absolutely. Yes, human rights question is quite important. It was one of the main points of the critical dialogue in the 90s between Iran and uh, European countries. Because, of course, uh, the revolution in, against the Shah was done, was supported by human rights activists. And so seeing Iran not implementing fully this uh, uh, promotion of human rights was a major issue. And those who were supporting Iran at the beginning are very uh, upset and uh, uh, not happy what, with the situation in Iran. That's a matter of fact. And I've heard just a minute ago that uh, uh, female activist Mrs. Su today was in jail yesterday, arrested yesterday. And every day we have got some problem like that. That's a matter of fact. They have got a lot of journalists in jail in Iran. That's very important. In Saudi Arabia, you have no journalists in jail. Why? Because in Saudi Arabia, there's no journalists, just photocopies. You take the statement by the state, you photocopy it, it is a journal. In Iran, that's different. You have got several journals, several newspapers, several publications, and of course, when uh, you speak too much, you go to jail. That's a matter of fact. But as a matter of fact, after 40 years, the balance of power between dictatorship, which is a matter of fact in Iran, and liberty is, uh, is changing. We have to remember that the revolution in Iran was done, the motto is independence, esterlal, asadi, jumudi, islami. Independence, liberty, republic, islamic. And so this struggle for human rights, this struggle for liberty, is implement, has been implemented in Iran. You can, human rights is not a gift you can find in the pocket. You have to struggle for it and to find and to, to build up a balance of power able to, uh, in, in a way that you can have after a while, a balance of power that the state, whatever it is, has to respect human rights. So in Iran, what is amazing these last 40 years is, of course, the price paid by women, by a lot of people in Iran for this struggle. But the, the outcome of it is to, that today, Iran is maybe, of course, not the best country in the world in this field, a country with the dynamics of struggle for liberty, and for independence, and for human rights is one, one of the most efficient in the Middle East. 
I don't think I don't think uh, don't say at all that uh, everything is perfect. Far from that. But the dynamics is there, and the model of Iran in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in so many countries, it is so uh, dangerous for this country because in Iran, because of the struggle of the population, even the nation, and the struggle not only among the Westerners population of northern parts of Tehran. No. It belongs now, this struggle is also inside the traditional Muslim, traditional communities. Now, because of the fact that in Iran, almost all the population is literate. Women now have got the right in a village to read and write, and so they are not married at the age of 14 as it was previously. They are go to school, and, and so everything is changing, and that's a major issue. About human rights, one point important. When GCPOA was signed, it was a major achievement for the Iranian population. After years and years of struggle of Iran being considered as a rogue state with war and so on and so forth, they had the opportunity to enter again the international community, to have jobs, to have international companies, companies coming into Iran, to find jobs in international culture. It was a major hope in Iran. A, a, a real revolution. It was the outcome of the dreams of the Islamic revolution of the 78, 79. At least we have independence, liberty, republic, and welfare. And unfortunately, Mr. Trump said, no, I don't want international companies to go to Tehran. I don't want international companies to give jobs to the people. I don't want international companies to go there and to make this dynamics again promoting human rights among the, uh, these ideas. And that's a major aggression against human rights inside Iran because of the political situation in Iran. What may happen? That the right-wing the, the right people, radical people inside Iran can say, oh, look at it. what Trump has, is, has done. It's not Trump. It is the US and the Western countries as a whole. French companies, German companies are withdrawing from Iran. So it's uh, supporting uh, the war against Iran. So Iran must be, again, a tough country, an aggressive country, uh, hostile to the US, to Western countries, and, of course, hostile to human rights. So outcome of withdrawing from GCPOA by Mr. Trump and the others is a major attack, a major war against Iran, against Europe, and against also human rights in Iran. Of course, I thank you very much. Uh, of course, I don't talk as an ambassador here because the meeting is, the meeting is unofficial. If uh, I was uh, ambassador, uh, as an ambassadorial presence, I had just to say yes and no and no <laughs> explanation. Uh, however, on uh, very good questions, let me do, I think it, they were answered, but on uh, Saudi and Iranian relationship. I think uh, it is a fact right now that Iran is for cooperation with Saudi Arabia on the record. Is for, as uh, Dr. Farazman said, is for regional dialogue in which all the literal states of the Persian Gulf are invited based on operative uh, paragraph. paragraph uh, number eight, operative program number eight of resolution 598. And uh, we have never responded to these provocations of Saudis, the wording that they use. And I think there were more than 25 uh, proposals for reconciliation, mediation, mediation, track tools, and so on and so forth between Iran and Saudi Arabia by Europeans, by Japanese, by the others. And I think our answer to all of them has been positive, and Saudi's uh, response to all of them have been negative. Uh, we are not begging for a relationship, but we think uh, we are ready for resolution of conflicts, and we are not for escalation, because it's not to the interest of both nations. But for whatever reason, 
which was explained by Dr. Farazman, they think uh, uh, time is not on their side for resumption of relationship or reducing your tensions. Now on the issue of uh, migrants, I was shocked by the question. Does Iran have any responsibility to take back some of the refugees of West Asia in it, on its soil? What are you talking, man? I mean, what, where is our responsibility in taking, uh, uh, you know, uh, refugees? I think it is out of a very, very, let's say, uh, a specific way of thinking about Europe, about the others, and deferring the responsibility to the others. Furthermore, you should know that Iran, not just recently, historically, has been very receptive to refugees. And you know, we, there are more than 100,000 Polish refugees who came to Iran during World War II. You know, Iran during the World War II was under occupation. Its economy was not good, but the Iranian people welcome this uh, uh, Polish people. And right now, if you go to Warsaw, there is a square and there is a ploy uh, in the commemoration of Iranian hospitality. Now, on the issue of uh, uh, our good neighbor Afghanistan and uh, its people in Iran, actually, I, I like the concept of dynamism. There is a dynamism inside Iran, a lot of... Uh, uh, changes and a lot of uh, positive trends. You may be astonished that in this year, what we call in Iran concours or uh, national entrance exam for graduate schools, three of the first uh, who got into uh, university by the highest degree were uh, Afghanistanis who were in Iran and they were all of them were on the first page of Iranian uh, papers. And the issue of their schooling uh, had some um, uh, legal uh, challenges, but it was uh, solved by a decree of uh, the Supreme Leader. Now, uh, all the Afghanistani individuals who are, uh, who are in Iran, were, in bo were born in Iran, they are uh, entitled to free education, elementary education, and the issue was solved. Uh, furthermore, uh, it may be interesting for you to hear that uh, more than 60% of Afghanistanis in Iran were born in Iran. And uh, the same size are uh, literate. So the rate of literacy among Afghanistanis in Iran is an astonishing compared to Afghanistan itself even. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, Afghanistanis who were educated in Iran, I was in Kabul twice this, uh, last year, uh, and uh, the impact of Iranian education is vividly there in the different cities. Now, uh, on the issue of human rights, actually I finished a course, this semester, teaching a course on human rights in the United Nations this semester, so I may be able uh, to uh, look at from other uh, different angles on the issue of human rights. Of course, it is uh, fashion just to focus on uh, specific uh, uh, cases and so on and so forth. But I would like to report to you that uh, Inside Iran, there is a high interest in human rights as a very practical as well as academic issue. And the number of uh, courses, the number of uh, programs, the number of laws uh, and bylaws on human rights, uh, and uh, even writings in daily papers on human rights is really interesting and astonishing. And uh, even inside the government, uh, look at foreign ministry. 20 years ago, we didn't have a, a division on human rights. Now we have a director general ship for uh, human rights, and she's a lady, director general of human rights. And uh, her job is not just to 
defend the cases. Uh, her job is also to really connect uh, uh, Iran with uh, the whole uh, commitments that we have uh, on international side on human rights within the framework of uh, law. Furthermore, there is an advisor to the, every minister this day. Actually, it's not more advisor. It's called the Asyurvige, a special assistant to all ministers. It is a, a new phenomenon. Just last few years for human rights and uh, the job of that person and it's a different person than the Director General of Human Rights in the Ministry. Uh, and in all ministries have, have so, uh, since I teach this course and I'm engaged a little bit on the scholarship, uh, scholarly side of uh, human rights, uh, I end by saying that even in Om, the religious uh, capital of Iran, uh, there is a specific course uh, for Mujtahids, for those who are becoming the highest level of uh, religious uh, uh, studies on human rights. So it's not just the cases. You have to look at the trends and see how uh, they, they are. Um, I end by saying that Iran is a debating society. We debate everything in social media, in papers, in the parliament, in, in, uh, here and there. And it is a dynamic society. You cannot be fixated on different notions or occasions or events. Thank you. Professor Hamta. Well, uh, frankly, I forgot uh, what was the topics that were discussed. But I would like only topics to like say, this, because right. somebody just attacked me personally, I just have to say that uh, the lady is not wrong. By the way, I am not a lady. My name is Shireen Hunter. I have a name. And so this shows one aspect of the mentality of Islamic Republic that I am perhaps still considered mukhaddare or whatever. So ambassador was not even willing to mention my name. So it was honor. I don't know who told you that. Uh, there were people in the foreign ministry at the time uh, who were not uh, pro Shah. And so this could be one of those persons. But I was there and I knew who were that had come from New York. And I I know that for my ambassador, Dr. Fatosh, he will never talk to anybody in that way. Plus, he's an exile in Geneva. Anyway, I don't want to get into that, but because I'm not representing the Shah. One thing I would like also to say that it's been 40 years since the Shah has gone. Even if, what, how, no matter how bad he was, and no matter has his father done, you have had 40 years of correcting that. And I'm sorry to say that your record, whether it is in foreign affairs, whether it is on economics, whether it is on Iran's, um, what do you call it, ezat, what ezat is that we go to talk to Elham Aliyev to give us money so that we can build the railroad from uh, Astara to Astara. I'm sorry, but this is it. Why is talking to America is a lot, but talking to some uh, uh, Turkman and, and going to India saying, please India, come and build Chahbahar. If the Shah had been there, Chahbahar would have been finished hundreds of times. Just would have been finished hundreds of times. If it was, so I'm trying to say is that please, he was bad, he was the devil incarnate. Reza Shah was the devil incarnate. He did nothing. Bali, he, he didn't do. You have had now 40 years of freed. What did you do? You put the country eight years in war. And uh, why did you have to export revolution? What is our business? Didn't you learn what uh, uh, Egypt did? Egypt got uh, uh, stuck, and now Egypt is nothing because of export of revolution. Al Sora to Yemen, Al Sora to this, and Al Sora to that. So I'm just trying to say, to be honest, I'm tired of hearing this, and I'm tired also of hearing of independence. The other side of the I'm not tired. No, no. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, the other side of independence, frankly, is isolation. 
Um, because on the one hand, you are saying you are, the world is interconnected and we are all getting together. On the other hand, you say that we've got to have to cuddle for ourselves that you know, we, we are not uh, you know, polluted to that. On the other hand, I would like to say on the human rights. Unfortunately, I have a very jaundiced view of human rights debate internationally. Among my other functions, when you work in a small mission, you go to all the commercial. Unfortunately, I also had to go to all the human rights meetings uh, with the uh, Commission on Minorities and so on and so forth. They used to exaggerate Iran's human rights records there. Mujahideen Khalq used to go to say that 100,000 prisoners were under the Shah. I mean, 100,000 prisoners, Iranian prison could not have even hold 100,000 prisoners. And Amnesty International, Britain, and so on. Unfortunately, big powers use human rights as an instrument of pressure. They used it during the Shah, and they are using it now. Nobody talks about human rights violation in Turkey. Even now, Ustav, look what Erdogan did. They never said anything about the Turkish generals. Turkish generals were 100 times worse than the Shah. But Turkish, Turkey is vital for the West. There is this trace of Dardanelle. Iranians don't seem to get it in their head. They are peripheral. They are not Qibli Alam. They are not Qibli Alam. And so this is one of the problems that the Shah couldn't come to terms with, he constantly said. And basically, the Shah exacerbated everybody, exacerbated Jiska Destan, exacerbated uh, Carter, exacerbated uh, Britain, and so on. And people say he's gotten, and now you have done 100 times worse than the Shah. You are saying to me. So the point is that let's just forget about the Shah. What are you now trying to do uh, to, to help the country uh, come over it? The only stuff that you have, your minister of uh, um, health said that 50% of the hospitals in Iran are still the ones that were built during the Shah. The, sad, the, the, the uh, dams that were built under the Shah are still functioning. Sad the Gatman the, is now has caused more problems. Than, why? Because you wanted to be independent. You didn't want to bring in technology and so on. So I'm sorry, we have to be. Iran has reached the point where we can no longer talk about niceties. It is now the crunch time. It's now the crunch time. We can't talk about niceties uh, anymore. And so I think. But we can't talk nice. We can't talk nice, but not pulling everything under the, the... When it comes to Saudi Arabia, why do you think Saudi Arabia can challenge Iran this way? Do you think that Saudi Arabia, even King Faisal, he hated Iran. Faisal hated the Shah, but he was forced to deal with the Shah because, you know, Iran had some uh, uh, prestige. Why do you think that Prince Turkey, that I have debated with him at Ditchley, at other places, uh, comes and how could any Arab, even uh, Nasser, Jamal Abdel Nasser, could not say to anybody that cut this uh, um, snake's head? Even Abdel Nasser didn't dare to say that. Even Saddam Hussein didn't dare to say that. Why is it? Because they see that Iran is at odds with everybody. I mean, you know, you cannot, whether you like it or not, the United States is your neighbor in the Persian Gulf. You know, it, it's no longer America on the other side. It's your neighbor in the Persian Gulf. And so this is what I am trying to say. You, Iran needs to have reorganized its priority. You know, I haven't been to Iran for 20 years, and I don't expect that I will see it before I die. I know that, no, I won't see it because I'm, I'm getting old. This is not a human rights. Iran does not belong just to a one group of people. In Shah's time, yes, if Rod Manish wanted to go and live in uh, um, East Germany, he was right, but there was no Iranian, as long as they didn't try uh, to, to get rid of the uh, government structure, was banned from coming. You know, this is this sort of a certain thing. No Iranian now dares to come. After all these people that have been uh, in prison, I'm not going to go to Iran, even if anybody says come, because I don't know what's going to uh, what's going to uh, happen. So the point is that now we have to forget about the past, but uh, look into the uh, future. But on the other hand, I also would like to add that Europeans also really 
I, I will say this because my last chance I can say this. Uh, because Bernard Foucault said that Iran was uh, Europe's uh, the first East member. But Iran also has always been Europe's other. If you look at Aeschylus, you know, I once was at the conference in Greece, and I tried to be nice to Greeks, actually, and I said certain things, talked about xenophone and, and all that. And a mom d'académie française, Tell to me that attacked me personally. He says, when I heard uh, this uh, Dr. Hunter speaking, I heard the sound of Zaraxis's horse or something like that. So Iran has always been the other. Uh, Greeks, the Persians were the others. Uh, the Romans, Iran was the other. This is a sad fact that uh, now we have an internal other. We have groups that don't like the idea of Iran. They want to submerge Iran into some kind of uh, uh, Islamist uh, universalism. And this is more uh, threatening than Alexander, it's more threatening than the Arabs, it's more threatening than the Mongols, because they all got, they all got fascinated by Iranian culture, they became Persianers. Alexander married Roxana, the other one did this. Mm -hmm. But now our government is fighting against Iran. And if they want to do this, this is not gonna, this is not gonna wash. And I think that blaming the Shah or the Pahlavis or the Qajars or who knows, Sasania and some do, um, they, it's not gonna solve uh, uh, Iran's problem. So Iran's problems are fundamental. It's not JCPOA only. And as long as the fundamental issues are not addressed, whether JCPOA stays or goes, these are not going to uh, solve uh, Iran's problem. This is a major issue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with respect to the issue, I want to go to the, to the uh, ground. Uh, otherwise, I would like to go to Iran and have a view of uh, your own. For example, to go on to the form of analysis of the Shah. Well, I'm not surprised that it was presented very objectively, very neutral in consistent views of the uh, people. So I think uh, I agree with you that one should not always go and should see the Shah in a different view, as, for example, the Shah analysis in Tehran shows. Just Thank you very much. Uh, one of the friends asked uh, about uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia. Push the button. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, he told the Saudi Arabia has money, Saudi Arabia has oil and Saudi Arabia has a strategic relation with the United States, how Iran uh, is going to compete with Saudi Arabia. Uh, first of all, we don't need to compete with Saudi Arabia and we don't want to compete with Saudi Arabia because we think that Saudi Arabia is not at the level which uh, deserve uh, to be competed by Iran. Despite the picture that uh, Professor Hunter uh, gave from Iran, uh, I think there is no doubt that the uh, contemporary uh, uh, history, never in the past, Iran was stronger than today. Iran is so strong, Iran is not superpower, but Iran is a very powerful regional actor. Despite of all uh, you said about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has foreign reserves, Saudi Arabia has oil. Show me a place that Saudi Arabia is acting better than Iran. Do they act better in Iraq? Do they act better in Syria? Do they act better in, in, in uh, Yemen? Do they act better in, in Lebanon? No. For being a regional power, having money and having strategic relation with superpowers is not enough. Vice versa, we think the secret of Iranian strength and power is, is independent security system. We are not going to beg security and import security from the United States. 
we had very bad experience in the past. And look at the, the, the situation uh, right now. What happened between Saudi Arabia, between the U.S. allies and uh, United States? Where the United States were committed fully to the security of its allies. Shah had strategic relation with the United States. What the United States did to Shah? What the United States did to Hosni Mubarak? What the United States did to Ali Abdullah Saleh? What the United States is doing to Saudi Arabia? Since 2003, Saudi Arabia was complaining about the uh, type of relation with the you know, United, United States. And they were telling that the United States is not committed to the security of Saudi Arabia and the other Arab allies uh, enough. In the eyes of Saudi Arabia, Obama was the worst president of the United States because of JCPOA, because of acceptance of Iranian regional rule. And now they believe that Trump is an opportunity for, for, for Saudi Arabia. I will tell you after two, three days, two, three years, what will happen between Saudi Arabia and the United States. Trump is not better than Obama for service. He's implementing what he promised in his campaign. He told these countries are like calves. We have to milk them, and after they finish the milk, we have to sutter them. We have to kill them. Trump is not committed more than Obama to the security of Saudi Arabia. Trump is just a very costly option for, for, for the Saudis. On Syria, what is the Iranian policy on Syria? As I told Iran is, an, is, is a regional uh, actor. Iran has strategic vision. And for a country which has a strategic vision, it's important to have uh, a solid strategy, not having double standard strategy. What we say in Syria is exactly what we say in Iraq and what we say in, in, in Yemen. In Syria, we believe that the sovereignty of the country, territorial integrity of country is important. We have to preserve and we have to protect the sovereignty and integrity of Syria. The Syrian problem was not just a problem between the government and the peaceful opposition. Right after the crisis, all the, you know, uh, Arab rivals sent terrorist groups to, to, to Syria. Hundreds of terrorist groups were fighting inside, Saudi, in, inside Syria. Syria was an ally of Iran before the crisis and after the crisis. The problem of Syria is a geopolitical problem and geopolitical question. And what was the result of Syrian crisis? For more than four years, Saudi Arabia and its allies denied to accept Iranian role in the in, in, uh, peace process in Geneva. And after that, we were in Astana and we uh, launched our process with Russia and with, with uh, uh, Turkey. And all the Arab rivals are out of the process. And they are complaining that why three non-Arab states are deciding and negotiating over an, an Arab country, and no Arab country is inside the, 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 the process. We think that this is the responsibility and the right of the people of Syria to decide about the, the future of Syria and to decide who has to remain and who has to uh, leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I came very late, so I think uh, I uh, have to say that the board, no, I have to say that uh, people have been 
engaged uh, from uh, the morning onwards. So I think uh, we will close the official part, but I uh, hand over to Stephanie Fenka because she will tell you what is coming up. So thank you very much uh, for you two for uh, that we came here, that you stayed so long. It was nearly two hours uh, on June 14, although it's really out the opening of the championship, the football championship. I'm very happy that so, so many people are here and that you are interested in these topics. And we as an as a international institute for peace, we try to get people to discuss. And even if it's challenging, and it has been challenging the whole day, and not everyone is always in line with each other. But this is also to listen to each other and to get uh, to talk to each other is a precondition for future engagement and also for, for change at some point. Uh, so my thank you to all of you. It was a pleasure to have you here the whole day. Thank you very much. Thanks for you. And now we are going downstairs. For all of you, we have been invited you to some drinks and also some um, small Persian snacks downstairs. And it's hot in here, so we could not open it. It's very loud outside. And please enjoy yourself. And maybe you can still discuss with each other. Maybe some of them will still be here for some minutes. Take the opportunity and have a nice evening.